Welcome back. Best-selling author Jan Martel studied philosophy at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, before leaving to travel throughout India for six months. His experiences there helped him craft his mega-hit book, Life of Pi. Here's part two of my exclusive interview with Jan Martel. One of the, the primary motivations for writing this book was to deal with the issue of human evil. Mm. You, you, you ex expand on that for a minute. Well, that's the one thing. In the secular world, as powerful as technology is and as extraordinarily expressive as art is, in the face of evil, all art can do is be descriptive. You know, what, what do you do when there's a great evil when you're an artist? Let's say Guernica. You know, a, a little Basque Pueblo is bombed by the Nazis during the Spanish Civil War. Picasso is moved by it. What does he do? He does a painting that describes that suffering. Art is descriptive, and it can be extraordinarily powerful in its description, but it doesn't go beyond that. Art remains intramural in a sense. What I like about religion is it's extramural. It goes beyond that. It tells and you why? It goes beyond that. It, try, it, says, it tries to put it into a context. So religion is a wonderful machine for digesting evil. Religion, to, like no other human endeavor, uh, no other human uh, uh, yeah, endeavor, manages to put evil into perspective. It's sometimes tremendously mm -hmm. difficult. In fact, that was one of the starting points for this novel for me, was a tragedy, in fact, that happened here in, 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 in British Columbia, Rena Virk. Mm -hmm. Do you remember right, Rena yes, Virk? She yes. was this teenager, mm -hmm. beaten to death and left to drown by her friends. And um, the big scandal was because it was a girl that was mostly the, right. the prime mover. So violence, girls against girls, was st uh, a, a new, new form of evil. Yeah, a yeah. new form of evil. But what really struck me is uh, three days after her, her body was discovered, the first statement her family made to the media, to the world, was, we forgive her killers. Mm. Now, it turned out they were, I think, Jehovah's Witnesses. So in a sense, Christian fundamentalists. But when I first read that, I thought, Man, any belief system that can make me say three days after my 16-year-old daughter has been discovered dead and brutally killed, to be able to say, I forgive mm. her killer, I don't care what it is, if it's a delusion, you can dismiss any way you, right, which way right. you want. Some belief system that can make you say that has got to have something going for it. Are we good by nature, but we uh, go off the track, or are we inherently evil and yet are trying to find our way back home? You know what I mean? What, how would you describe that? Well. My, I can only describe from yeah. my own personal experience in life, which to some extent has been sheltered, but I have noticed that generally we are attracted to good. When we do good, first of all, when we receive goodness, we appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And the fact is when we do good, we feel good. So I think there's a natural tendency to it, but it can easily be distorted. It can be warped uh, for various reasons. But I find evil is intolerable. People who do great evil are deeply unhappy people. I don't think mm -hmm. anyone is truly evil and actually happy. Mm. I think there's a, a the high level of delusion about who they are and what they're doing. So you don't want to just choose right. one or the other, but I, I think generally as a species, we have a tendency to be peaceable and to be good. But of course, we're not perfect, and so there's outbreaks mm. of evil. There's this moment uh, for the character Pi where he finds himself on the life raft uh, with the tiger, Richard Parker, which is, I just, I love that that's his name. Um, and he, he's kind of, he has to weigh this, the, the decision early on. Is it me or the tiger that's going to die? Mm. Do I kill him or will he kill me? But then he comes to this, this higher, it seems to be saying, a higher, a, a higher way of approaching the situation. Maybe it's not an either or. Maybe we can both exist. Yeah. Is, is that a metaphor for religion for you? Well, absolutely. The tiger can represent many things. In a sense, the tiger could be a symbol for God. God has power over us, but we're afraid of him. We have to pacify God. You know, Pi does it with food. We do it with our prayers and our offerings. It can be, but also, at, at a more psychological level, yeah, the, what, the, what's interesting about Christianity is how, it, you know, the, the amazing thing about Christ is how defeat is turned into victory. Here we have the Messiah riding into Jerusalem, held by the Jews to be the next Messiah. He will be a political ruler who will expel the Romans. They expect tangible, material, mm -hmm. political right. things out of him. He ends up being strung up, like a, strung up on a cross like a common thief. And that must have astounded mm -hmm. the early, early Christians, the Jews who followed him. Mm -hmm. And then you have Paul who has this brilliant idea of saying, no, wait a second, this was all intended. His defeat is, in fact, is his victory. And that ability to turn defeat into victory is, is an extraordinary, clever, and deep trick. And the same thing, the tiger is the same thing. The tiger is a victimizer, mm -hmm. but in a sense, he's also a victim. Uh, he's stranded on this lifeboat. 
Pi is victimized by the tiger, but he turns that into something positive. Mm -hmm. Let me use that. Let me transform that. Hmm. You also there's a you use the the idea of a symbiotic relationship on the, on the island, for instance. Yeah. The nature itself has learned to uh, adapt and work with, and then therefore become stronger and better. I had this idea that that maybe you were saying that as religion uh, faith grows, it can learn to work with other faiths and become stronger. Were you were there, were there those overtures as well? Well, I was not. I mean, the, the novel wasn't a tract on on you know religious. Right. I know it's a one to one thing. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, but I would say that it is puzzling that religions uh, think so poorly of each other. Um, mm. The one thing that I've noticed. Religious expression is very different. They're not all the same. You know, Buddhism has a highly impersonal view of the divine, whereas Christianity is very highly personalized. God the Father, God the Son. It's very personalized. So those are very, and even in their practice, they're very different. Mm -hmm. there's, there's something profoundly social about Islam. Uh, Hinduism is a non-congregational religion. Uh, Christianity often can be practiced in a very solitary way. They're all different in their practice, but one thing I've noticed is the similarity of faith. When you meet people who have a deep faith, so I'm not talking with the weirdo American evangelists. Right. I'm talking when you meet people who just have a deep faith, they are all the same. You say you read the foundational texts of, of Hinduism, Islam, and Christianity. In your research, which you obviously spent a great deal of time doing, did you come across uh, things in the religions themselves, in the texts, that you found you, that you couldn't grab a hold of, that you, you found repulsive, or you, that you, you had a tough time grabbing, a, you know, connecting with? Not, well, Every religion has something objectionable to it. You know, uh, um, the caste system in Hinduism, mm. for example, which is institutionalized, sanctified racism. Um, uh, uh, you know, Christianity is, you know, largely homophobic and, and, mm. and sexist. But you know, I guess the question is, you know, re religion is an attempt to understand what can't be fully understood. Mm. It is an attempt to grasp mystery, and. Our, our, our tools and understanding are limited, so we will make mistakes. That's the only way I can understand it. Because, you know, religions, either they're all right, and then it's kind of paradoxical, or they're all wrong. Hmm. You know, it, the, none of them are perfect. All of them are cultural attempts to understand what goes beyond culture. So the way I view what I've done in my religious practice is whatever God house I enter, I try to go to what is authentic and what I find objectionable, I just leave aside. And I say, hmm. well, I don't understand this. You know, for example, it seems quite clearly in the Bible, uh, the, the homophobia seems really there, black and white. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do about that? I cannot believe that Jesus, if he appeared 20 years ago when the AIDS crisis was, was striking the North America, I cannot believe that he would see it, all these gay people who were devoting themselves with extraordinary devotion and, and compassion to fellow people who are suffering, that he would dismiss them all as evildoers. It just, mm -hmm. I just can't believe that. It, it mm -hmm. seems to go against the entire spirit of his religion, yeah. of, of who he was. And the same thing with every religion. There are yeah. things that seem objectionable, um, but I leave those aside as being human errors.